Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of the screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits. I have the first step in a spinning breed study. I have some new works in progress, and I have some answers to some questions from viewers like you. So let's get started. This first tidbit came to me from the Fleece and or Fleece to Fashion Instagram and Twitter feed. And it's two images. They I believe they're both fashion plates from the early 19th century. And they each show women knitting, but they're knitting with very different sorts of knitting needles in very different poses. So one of them is using uh, double pointed needles and she has her pocket um, on the outside of her dress. So pockets were very common in women's clothing while the skirts were large enough to have them. And they would either have them hanging from their waist, but inside their skirt, and then there would be a, uh, like a slit in their skirt where they could put their hand in, or they might wear the pocket on the outside if that was more convenient. And so she was keeping her yarn in her external pocket, which is hanging a little bit lower. I'm not sure why she has that basket there. I always thought that that basket was to hold the yarn. And so I'm not really clear what's going on. If anybody has an idea, I'd love to hear it. The second image is a woman with very long straight needles knitting something. Um, and this is from a fashion plate that I believe was printed in 1802. So these came from two different museum collections. The first one with the double points came from the, from I think they call it LACMA, Los Angeles County Museum of Art or something like that. Um, and I'll leave a link to that one. The second one came from a French museum and I have the name of the museum, but I couldn't get the direct link within the museum's collection to get so that you could see that image. And the only link I could find just took me right to the French Museum. This next tidbit came to me from uh, someone on my Ravelry, in my Ravelry group, B. Gao, who lives in Canada, posted a link to a YouTube documentary on the Salish knitters of the Pacific Northwest. And so this documentary is only going to be available to watch on YouTube until July 16th. So you need to watch in the next week. Otherwise, I believe it's going to be uh, taken down. But I will leave that link down in the show notes below. And this week's contribution came from Blackwater Vintage Knits on Instagram. And so this phrase is dyed in the wool. So in the English language, we might say somebody is a dyed in the wool conservative. And what we would mean by that is there's, they're completely unmovable on that aspect of their personality. There's no way to change their mind about being a conservative. They are dyed in the wool. The meaning of that word comes from the different ways that textiles can be dyed. Like we're in the process of creating a textile, the fiber might be dyed. So I'm gonna do a little bit of an overhead to kind of show you the different possibilities of when something can be dyed and what it means when we say something is dyed in the wool. This is fiber that has been dyed. It hasn't been spun yet. It's been washed and combed and, and the fibers have been dyed. And in this case, you have this kind of variegated uh, group of fibers. So when they're spun together, when the fibers are drafted together and then spun like this, it's mo most likely will look like a solid uh, color. But if you do have different fibers, like you different colors and you comb them together or card them together before you spin them, the fibers themselves will be dyed in the wool and the yarn, but the yarn might have a more heathered look because you can see if we look close in here that you have a couple of different colors of actual fibers that make up this particular yarn. This yarn 
was dyed after it was produced and it's dyed in kind of a tonal way. So you have this uh, main color all the way through if you untwist this yarn. It's still red all the way through, but you can also see that there is some variation on the surface where other color has been applied on top of it as well. This yarn was dyed after it was spun. This is a self-striping yarn, and the way self-striping yarns are created is that they figured out how to run the yarn, the completed yarn, through a machine that will apply the dye in very specific ways. And it's really on the surface. And, and so, so sometimes the effect is meant to be not completely solid, and then there's transitions between colors, but you can see if you look at this yarn, if you untwist it, you can see that there are, are bits of white in it. Um, but even if you look at, at an area that seems to be more solid, just when you untwist it, you can, you can sometimes see that on the inside of the yarn, it, there's just a lighter color in the places where the yarn has twisted around itself. And then finally, that you can take something that isn't dyed at all and turn that into fabric, whether it's knitted fabric or woven fabric, and you can dye the fabric. So just like you can do a self-striping yarn, you could do a print fabric, um, or you could completely submerge the fabric and, and dye it completely. And I've done that with a, a sweater in the past where I dyed it. And if you have certain types of stitch patterns, the dye might not get into those little crevices, just like when you untwist the yarn, sometimes you see a little bit of light color on the inside. That can happen with fabric, knitted fabric, especially if you're uh, working with something that's um, a really uh, tight, uh, lumps together like Trinity stitch or cables. Sometimes those places where the, the, the stitches will cross over each other, you'll get less dye in those locations. This next tidbit came to me, I think I came across it when we were down in Santa Fe a few weeks ago. I was looking up tapestry weaving, Googling it, and in that process, I came across a video of a woman who's apparently like one of the, the our country's experts on tapestry weaving. She's written at least one book recently. Uh, her name is Rebecca Mezoff, and she was weaving a little tiny, on a little tiny loom. Um, she was doing some tapestry weaving and I was just watching her do it. She wasn't explaining what she was doing. She was just doing it. I just found it mesmerizing to watch her do that and to see, to see her just doing her technique. She wasn't explaining what she was doing. She's just doing it. And I found it really sort of relaxing to watch her and I thought you might enjoy it as well. Every year during the, the three-week Tour de France, there is a group of, of spinners worldwide who participate in Tour de Fleece. So they are setting a personal goals for themselves for that three-week time period during the Tour de France. And this year, Fiber Love Diary, that's a, a YouTube channel, and the woman who runs it is, is, twi is Trish. She's a weaver and a dyer and a spinner and a knitter. She she's, seems to do everything. And she's a very experienced spinner. And so she decided what she wanted to do was to spin 20 minutes every day during a live stream. And, and Part of that was just to get over her fear of doing a live stream. So she's just sitting there spinning and she's looking at the comments and answering uh, questions and talking to people as she's spinning. So she usually is on um, for five, 10 minutes before she even sets her 20 minute timer so that the live streams are lasting about 30 minutes. So I'm gonna leave a link down below. I am finding it very relaxing to watch her spin, but also, inspiring just to be able to watch somebody spin who isn't like directly instructing them like hold your hands like this and do this just to watch what she's doing naturally and kind of absorb absorb that and I, I'm finding it very inspiring. So uh, whether you are participating in Tour de Fleece or you are trying to get back into spinning or you're an avid spinner or just never seen anybody actually doing any spinning, 
you might find it a uh, really interesting um, to watch. So that will be going on through Tour de, through the end of Tour de Fleece every day. She's taking Mondays off from live streaming. And then once Tour de, de Fleece is over, she'll continue to do a live stream uh, once a week on the weekend. She hasn't decided yet Saturday or Sunday. But if that's something that you're interested in and in finding a community of spinners and just interacting and watching somebody spin live, uh, you might be interested. So I mentioned Fiber Love Diary in the last tidbit. I found her channel about a month or two ago when I was talking about I wanted to get back into spinning and I, and I think I was just, I've been struggling with this. Ever since I started spinning, I've really struggled with how do I want to go through learning the most about spinning in a way that makes sense for me and allows me to produce, to learn as much as I can and also produce usable yarn. Um, and somebody mentioned that she was doing a breed study and that was something I'd been really interested in. So I looked at her channel and she was doing a breed study that she bought this kit from Wool Gatherings, which is on Etsy. So there are a lot of different shops on Etsy that sell breed kits. Uh, and But I thought, oh, this is fantastic. I'm just gonna buy the one that she's using. Uh, I bought it. it, has three different, or 30 different breeds. It's all uh, combed top. You get one ounce of each type. And to me, this seemed like the perfect amount. It would allow me to sample uh, different wool breeds. I wouldn't need to process it myself. I wouldn't need to wash the fleece and, and do that process. That That is a step that I want to get to at some point, but uh, I, I have processed fleece before, but it just, to, to process an entire fleece and then spin the entire fleece and then, and then make it into something, that's just a little bit too much for me right now. So having a single ounce of, of combed top in each of these 30 different breeds seemed perfect to me. So I was really fascinated to watch how Trish was doing all of this because she's a very experienced spinner and that's one of the things that overwhelms me is like how, how do I create a process for myself in order to keep track of what I'm doing and to make decisions about things and how do I make those decisions. So I just have been watching how she does it and so I decided um, my source for how I do my breed study is going to be Trish at Fiber <laughs> Love Diary. She uh, was using the Fleece and Fiber source book to help her understand more about each breed and what the characteristics of the fiber was. And then she would take a look at the fiber that she was actually sent and, and look at that in comparison to what was in the book. And then she would make a decision about uh, whether she was going to just use the comb top as it was, or if she was going to run it through her drum carter just one time in order to help disorganize the fibers a little bit in case she wanted to use um, a woolen draft rather than a worsted draft in order to spin it. So for me, that's like, okay, this eliminates a lot of the decisions. I can just copy what she's doing and so that I don't have to think about that while I'm just focusing on getting better at spinning. So my goal for all of, all of my yarn is to spin each ounce, ply it, and then knit it into a swatch, and then I will sew the different swatches together into like a reference blanket, and I will label the back of each swatch with what the wool breed was. So that is what I am going to use for my process. So my goal is to spin one breed per week. And so yesterday I spun my one ounce of, I call it Cheviot, Trish calls it Cheviot. In the UK, some people call it Cheviot. That's like there's Cheviot Hills, where I think where one of the branches of the breed, sheep breed came from. And uh, it's in this Northeast part of England. Um, but other places in the UK, people call it Cheviot. In New Zealand, there's a place name called Cheviot and that's how they pronounce it here in the US. We have at least one town by that name and it's, I think, Cheviot. Uh, it, our dictionary, the American pronunciation says Cheviot and that the British is Cheviot. So even though the place in the UK, the people there call it Cheviot, the dictionary is saying it, the pronunci British pronunciation is Cheviot. So obviously, 
it makes a difference what region, what dialect, what accent you have. So Cheviot, 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 whatever. I spun this yesterday and I will be plying it this weekend. This was another thing that kind of was throwing me is you have one full ounce and how do you, you know, unless I wanted to do chain plying every single time, um, which doesn't require me splitting this among, you know, different um, bobbins that I can then ply together. What Trish is doing is she's doing a version, a variation of what's called the Andean bracelet. It's basically a way of creating a center pull ball of yarn around your wrist, but a very loose one so that you can ply the two ends together, um, one from each and one from the center, one from the outside. You can ply those together and you can create your, your one ounce of your little small skein of yarn that you get out of your one ounce. So that, uh, I've done an Andean bracelet before and it seemed like just the way that I was doing it, I might have been doing it wrong. It, it just felt like I, it was binding up my hand and the way that she does her variation, which she calls like a turkey hand, um, as in gobble gobble turkey, that it's a little, it's looser and it seems like it might be more, might be easier to manage. So at this point, she is my spirit guide for spinning. <laughs> so my plan this weekend is to ply this and then knit it up into a swatch. I'm going to reserve uh, a certain amount of the single and some of the plied yarn to keep with my reference and so that I can just kind of document what I'm, I'm doing. I've really needed just sort of a guide to get me through something like this so that I don't feel so overwhelmed with the choices. This is my bobbin of singles that I spun from the Cheviot uh, top or Cheviot depending on where you're from. So uh, I, this was, I found this to be so easy to spin because it has such a long staple length. So I will uh, turn this into a two ply yarn uh, later this weekend, and then I will knit it up into my first uh, square for my breed study blanket. So I started a new project this week uh, which is a pair of socks using yarn I bought when I was on my road trip to Santa Fe. So I've, I've knit the first sock. Uh, now it's a kind of a departure, it's a departure in a couple of ways uh, for me. I, when I first learned to knit socks, I used to knit with solid color or, or tonal yarns pretty often. I would knit complex uh, sock patterns. I really loved uh, doing that. But over the years, I've transitioned to mostly knitting what I would call plain vanilla socks, just stockinette sock uh, using self-striping yarn. For me, that's just kind of that mindless uh, knit when I just want to knit without having to think. That's usually what I'm doing. And I use sweaters as a way to, to um, challenge myself. So I found this, this yarn in this shop, Acer Santa Fe, and I, I liked it. First of all, it was 100% it was Pullworth, which is a breed of wool. So that was a new breed. I hadn't come across it before. I'd heard of Pullworth before, but I was excited to find an actual yarn in an actual yarn shop that was a breed other than whatever the standard ones are. So Pullworth sheep are, were developed in Australia and they also can be found in New Zealand. They're not here in the United States. So the wool was imported from New Zealand and then it's an indie dyer and I believe she's in Texas and her company is called Chasing Rabbits. So this is uh, Chasing Rabbits Pullworth fingering weight yarn. So it's a color I really liked, but one of the things about knitting socks is I don't want to knit a solid color and stock in it because that will really bore me. So I also know that I didn't want to do a complex stitch pattern like in the old days. So I looked for something that was pretty simple, but it would kind of keep me interested in the same way that self-striping yarn can keep me interested. It's like enough of like, I have to pay a little bit of attention, but not too much attention. Um, that was what I was looking for. And the second thing that I wanted to do was to knit it toe up. So earlier this year, at the beginning of the year, I decided this was the year that I was going to try my best 
to find a way to tolerate knitting socks toe up because I've never liked it. And I, I wanted to find a way to not hate it, even if I didn't end up loving it. And so for me, what that has meant is find interesting or and you something that is interesting and different that really can only be done toe up or can only be done easily toe up or practically a toe up. So my first pair of socks, I did what was called a garter stitch toe. I did a video on that uh, process. It's a way of creating a toe where you're not having to do increases. You knit a square of garter stitch that, that say you want a 64 stitch sock, you'd have 16 stitches and you would knit 16 ridges of garter stitch so that you'd have 16 at the start, at the cast on edge, 16 live stitches on the needle, and then you'd pick up 16, um, one, one per ridge on each edge. That would give you your 64. So once you did that little square of garter stitch and you picked up around, you just had the number of stitches of socks. So that is not something that could practically be done uh, on a cuff down. Like there would no, be no good reason to do something like that cuff down. But, it, but there were some advantages um, to starting a sock toe up that way. And I thought, well, this is interesting. And so that was, that was my first sock was, you know, let me find an interesting toe. I'll use the same old heel that I always use in, you know, in each direction. It's worked exactly the same in both directions. So it was the toe that gave me something interesting um, to work on. In this case, it was the heel. It was a different method of doing a heel flap and gusset that I thought was much simpler, first of all, to get through the instructions and understand what to do. Uh, and I was, I was just intrigued by it. I'll go to the overhead and, you get, and I'll go through the sock and you can see uh, the different elements and I'll tell you the resources that I use for doing each component of the sock. In some cases, I have uh, videos for the techniques. In some cases, uh, I the video I have is for a cuff down version. Um, and in some cases, I do not have any type of video, but I'll let you know what I did. So this is a round toe and it is worked with, if you're working cuff down, you have eight decreases every time you have a decrease round. Uh, in this case, because I'm toe up, I have eight increases every time I have an increase round. And then you work plain rounds between decrease rounds. Uh, at the toe end, you have fewer plain rounds between each decrease round and you have uh, more and more decrease round or more and more plain rounds between each of the increase rounds as you are working in this direction. So I do have a video on the cuff down version of this toe and it can be done in a couple of different ways and it can also be customized based on the actual length of your toes. So I will leave a link uh, to that cuff down version up, up at the top as well as down in the show notes. Um, I will be doing a video on the toe up version at some point in the near future. I just don't have one yet. I used a, the stitch pattern from a cuff down sock pattern, a free one that I found on Ravel Ravelry called Petty Harbor. So I used that stitch pattern. It's a four stitch, four row repeat. I made a few changes in terms of how I have the pattern laid out with respect to the instep. I wanted to make something that was completely symmetrical. So even though it's a four stitch repeat, I have 29 stitches. So multiple of four plus one, I have 29 stitches on the instep. And I made sure that I had a very specific column of stitches as the first and last that would really frame the stitch pattern. Um, and then on the sole, I only had 27 stitches. So I have a 56 stitch sock. I'm working at eight stitches per inch. Um, and then the heel was a heel that was new to me. I saw it a couple places, but the one that I can remember that I found it was on Modern Daily Knitting. Kate Atherley had done a recipe on how to do this particular heel. And it was a, a version of heel flap and gusset I hadn't seen before. If you look at this heel, it's pretty wide and round for a heel flap and gusset construction. This is actually identically, uh, worked identically to the first half 
of a standard short row heel, like an hourglass heel, where you start out with all of the stitches and you work one, uh, one stitch less each time as you work your short row turns until you have a third of the stitches left. That is how this is worked here. And so you still have all of your stitches on the needle and then you work the heel flap and stockinette back and forth and you work that the last uh, stitch of the, I have 27 here, so I work that 27th stitch together with one of the stitches from the gusset. So it was, a, it was an interesting construction. It's, it, it, it fits really well and it's, it's just proportioned differently than a standard heel flap and gusset. Um, which is why I didn't use heel stitch here, which is a slip stitch pattern. I needed the, the, the length that the stockinette fabric would give me. Um, I, I haven't quite worked out exactly how to adapt the formula if you need a heel flap or heel uh, modifications like I typically do. I did modify it for myself and it seemed to work well. I don't know if I could have modified it slightly different to get an even better fit. Um, so I can't yet recommend how to make modifications for this heel. If you have a, um, a long heel diagonal like I do, I have a very high arch and so this part of my foot is much bigger in circumference than uh, the formulas for socks typically expect. The process is a little bit different and the proportions are a little bit different, but it seems to fit really well. Uh, then I just worked up the leg until it was, um, about, it was about an inch and a half shorter than what I wanted. And I switched to knit one pro one ribbing. And then I did um, what's called a grafted bind off. Like the last step of a tubular bind off, I don't do the setup, st setup steps for a tubular bind off because I find that it, it, it removes some of the stretch that you would get in that edge otherwise. Um, I do have a video on how to do uh, this kind of bind off in the round. Um, so I will link to that. My 60s vintage sweater is still on hold. It will be coming off hold off pause, it's out of its timeout uh, this weekend. I have been lately coming up with like a weekly plan of things I wanna get done. And then I, I just like look at my list. Okay, what is the thing I'm going to do next? Now, what am I going to do? So I, I, I'm keeping myself flexible, but I'm also giving myself structure. I need both of those things. And so far this seems to be working. But the thing that I haven't picked off of my list yet this week is uh, working on my 1960s uh, sweater. So that's that, that'll have to happen this weekend in order for me to get my weekly tasks done. Uh, in the meantime, when it went on hold, I didn't have anything to knit and so last week and so I w immediately went to well what's next in my mental queue of sweaters and that was a sweater that I had been working on reverse engineering last fall and my memory was I really figured everything out and it was just a matter of actually sitting down and knitting it. Um, and when I went to look for files and charts and spreadsheets I found a few things but not nearly what I expected to find, which meant that I was going to have to do some design work. I also felt like I had more information somewhere and I just had to figure out where it was. I did find it the other day. It's still not as extensive as I had imagined in my head, but I, I do have a lot more information to work on. So I am working on that. So that will likely be my next sweater that I start, that I'll be ready for that. In the meantime, I needed something to work on. Um, and I just acquired this 1950s uh, vintage book from Rhea, who sent it to me from Canada a couple weeks before, and I'd seen a jacket in there that I really liked. So I was looking through it and to see, well, well what does it require? Because I often do have a sweater's quantity worth of yarn in worsted weight wool on hand because that's the weight of wool that I use the most for sweaters. And so it is a, a type of yarn that I'm willing to buy a sweater's quantity worth if the opportunity presents itself. Now, the opportunity presented itself when I was down in Santa Fe a couple of weeks ago. 
and I walked in and I saw they had Kelburn Woolen Mills Germantown yarn. This is a yarn that I had heard about a couple of years previously. I think I really became focused on it when I started knitting these vintage and antique sweaters because the first two sweaters I knit from 1904 and 1918 both called for Germantown wool. Different brands, every brand, every yarn company back then had a Germantown wool. And from the research I had done, it's basically is a worsted weight wool. Well, a couple of years ago, and Germantown was a, a type of yarn that was sold well into the late 20th century. And I believe there was a brand called Brunswick that had a Germantown uh, wool that people really liked. And so what Calburn Wool and Mills wanted to do a few years ago is create a yarn that was like that. So I was very intrigued by that yarn and the whole concept of it. And then earlier this spring, I heard about this online event where a yarn shop on the West Coast um, in Washington, I think it's called Tolt, uh, was going to live stream a uh, conversation with Clara Parks, a presentation by Clara Parks, who's an expert on wool, uh, on their YouTube channel. And she was going to be talking about these different wools that Tolt sells. And these were all American-made yarns, American mills from American sheep. And so it was a whole range of yarns from extra fine merino all the way up to kind of a, a mid... Uh, sort of a coarser type of wool. And so you could buy a swatch pack from Tolt ahead of, ahead of this live stream and then knit up little swatches in each of those yarns and see what they were like. And then Clara would talk about it during the live stream. So one of the yarns was Germantown. And I was so excited because I'd been hearing about it for a few years and I, and I wanted to know how was this different from other worsted weight yarns. And I could tell from knitting with it, it was different. And I, but I, I wasn't quite sure because I was comparing it to the other yarns I was working with that day, not against other worsted weight yarns I've knit with. So I had that swatch, but I knew that I liked it. And I thought, okay, at some point I'm going to use this uh, for a sweater. Didn't have a plan, didn't buy any, didn't know where I could get it locally. And, you know, I like to see colors in person if I can, rather than buying it online. I will buy things online, but you know, I, and I didn't need it. I didn't have an idea for it. It was just in my head at some point, I'm going to get some Germantown. So when we were in Santa Fe and I walked into Anser Santa Fe and they had it, I thought, oh, well, I'll buy a sweater's quantity worth of this Germantown. And I, I looked at the colors they had and I found a color I really liked. And there were six skeins of it. And I thought, oh, that's really cutting it close. But it's what they had. She checked to see if they had more and they didn't. And I, I took them up to the cash register and I said, oh, I assume these are all, I didn't look, but I assume they're all the same dye lot. And she started looking. She said, no, these are actually two different dye lots. And then I thought, well, okay, then I don't want to buy them. And she said, but I can order them. And I thought, well, if she's going to order them, I know this is the color I want and I can get everything in one dye lot. That means I can also get an extra skein. I can get seven instead of six. So I was, met, I was talking about this last week and somebody asked me in the comments, how do you know what a sweater's quantity worth of yarn is? Is it just experience? And because she's always afraid that she's playing yarn chicken or that she's bought too much. Um, so typically, before you start the pattern, the pattern's going to tell, if you're using a pattern, the pattern's going to tell you how many yards you need. Vintage patterns will tell you what yarn to use and how many ounces of it, but you never know how many yards. So it's, it's trickier if you're using a vintage pattern where they're not telling you the yardage. But if you're using a contemporary pattern and they tell you use this many balls of brand X, you just look up how many yards are in each ball of brand X so that you can calculate the total number of yards you need. And then you look at you know what you have. So for contemporary patterns, if you're using a pattern, you should be able to calculate whether or not you have enough. If you're designing your own or you're making some kind of modification, then that's a little bit 
different. And that is why I use spreadsheets to calculate the total number of stitches so that when I'm working through the first couple of balls, I can see if I'm going to have enough based on the total stitch count. So those are some things that, that you can use to, to help you do that. And I, I certainly use that spreadsheet for that purpose when I'm doing the vintage patterns. Um, there have been times when I, I guessed incorrectly and I needed to order more yarn right away. And because it was such a recent order, I could get the same dye lot. But if you're in a situation where you don't know what you're going to knit and you have the opportunity to buy yarn, the way that I did it when I was first buying sweaters quantity worth of yarn, I, it was because it was on sale. It was the type of yarn I used a lot. It was like Cascade 220, uh, or it was, there was an online company called Elan that had a Peruvian Highland wool worsted weight yarn um, that would go on sale when they were going to get a new dye lot. Uh, and so they would sell the old dye lots by the bag so 10 50 gram skeins you'd have to buy in order to get that discount. So when I was first buying sweaters quantities worth of yarn, it was because it was on sale. And I, and I looked at the sweaters I'd knit before that were worsted weight and I looked at the range of yarn quantities that I used for different sweaters. And I decided that if I bought 10 100 gram skeins, if I bought 1,000 grams, which is um, like 2,000 meters or 2,200 2, yards. Uh, if I bought that much, 10 skeins of Cascade 220 or 20 balls of Elan Peruvian Highland wool, that would be enough to knit a heavily cabled sweater for my husband. So if I didn't know who I was going to knit for and I didn't know what I was going to knit for, I based it on the maximum I would be likely to need based on the sweaters I'd knit previously. Um, and in some cases, like with, with uh, Elan, you had to buy a bag of 10. So I either had to buy 10 balls or 20 balls and 10 balls wouldn't have been enough. So I had to buy 20. So that was how I did things initially. It was, it was I was buying it because it was on sale. What I realized over time was that, that yarn was staying in my stash because I might say, oh, I wanna knit a, a sweater, I'm gonna use worsted weight wool, and I'd look at what I had and I'd think, eh, I don't want any of those colors, I want a different color. And then I'd go get that yarn. So I started to realize I wasn't really saving money by spending money and then not using the yarn. And, but what I was doing was using up space on my shelves. So gradually, it, it took me probably 12 years to use up that yarn that I had bought. And it wasn't that many different sweaters worth of yarn. It was just that I never wanted to use it. I always wanted to buy something else. So what I changed to was if I come across a yarn that's unusual in some way and I'm out of town, so it's a yarn shop that I don't typically go to and they are carrying a yarn I've never seen before or they're carrying a yarn that I've heard of that I've wanted to try. There's something special about that yarn, then I will buy it. So I just got really lucky that in Santa Fe, I found a yarn that, I, that I'd been wanting, they had it, and then immediately afterwards, I found a pattern that required a yarn of that yarn weight. This is not a worsted weight, well, it's, or it's heavy worsted or almost Aran weight. So it's a little heavier than I would normally use. So I, I, mean, I was just so lucky that the pattern I chose needed something that was heavier. I was completely lucky. I bought seven skeins because I thought that'd probably be enough. I am likely going to use exactly five full skeins. I might go a little bit into the sixth based on the first couple of skeins, it's very possible that I could just end with those five, 500 or with those uh, five skeins and have two left over. But this is a pretty plain sweater and it's not terribly long. I do have sweaters that, have, that are cardigans, that takes more yarn, have pockets, takes more yarn, has a, a, a collar that, you know, is more extensive than normal, takes more yarn, 
and is heavily cabled. Again, takes more yarn. So I have knit a sweater that really did use nearly all 20 skeins, or 50 gram skeins of yarn. I, it, it really maximized the amount of yarn that I needed for that particular sweater. And so that was lucky that I had enough for that. And in other cases, I just have leftovers and it doesn't really uh, bother me. So it is, it's a combination of experience, uh, data, uh, what my criteria for for buying yarn is, it's it's a combination of things, but but a lot of the experience is just experience with the mistakes that I have made. <laughs> that's that's a lot of where the experience comes from. So another question that I had was if I was going to share the pattern that this that I'm knitting, and the answer is no. I don't have the right to that. I don't own the copyright. Copyright literally means right to copy. And distribute. And something published in the 1950s is very uh, unlikely to be out of copyright, particularly since this is a Canadian uh, publication. But this booklet is available. It's not, it's not terribly rare. You can find people selling it on eBay or Etsy or, or various different places. So you can get a copy of this if you're willing um, to, to spend a a little bit of money on it um, if it's something that you're really interested in. There's no ribbing on the base of this. I use a long tail cast on for my edge because that's always what I do pretty much. If I need an edge I must always use a long tail cast on. I didn't even think about it. Um, so the back is all stockinette and well, the whole sweater basically is stockinette until you get to the raglan uh, shaping and then you get this really cool um, garter stitch uh, stitch pattern. So uh, and this is the back of the neck up here. I did a little something different when I was starting the left front because again there's no ribbing at the bottom but there is a pocket and the pocket is open at the bottom because there's there's no ribbing. You're starting just with an edge and I knew that I was going to be working a single crochet, the way that you finish this edge is with a single crochet all the way around. You start here and you go across the left front and then across the back and then the right front and that's how the sweater is finished and when you do that you're going to be sealing the bottom of the pocket close. So it wasn't until I was getting ready to start this that I thought about the cast on that I was using and what I decided to do instead of the long tail cast on was to do a crochet cast on. See, it looks very much like a standard chain bind off, um, but the, it also, because it's a crochet chain, it's exactly what you would expect to, to have along an edge when you were doing a single crochet. I just felt like it would be easier to get through the edge um, nicely and to join up nicely to really match things really well. So I didn't think to do this on the back of the sweater. I don't think that's going to matter too much, but I did want something that was going to make joining this pocket uh, really easy. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.